Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is by Ellen Louise Chandler Moulton. On the Strike of the Clock. Of course, the very idea of a ghost revisiting the glimpses of the moon is an absurdity on the face of it. Shakespeare himself couldn't make it seem possible. His choicest ghosts smack of melodrama and suggest blue lights and the smell of brimstone. I was rather young when I made this remark, and I think I felt a little proud of my strength of mind and my superiority to benighted believers in the supernatural. At least, I expected the approval of the man to whom I was talking, a hard-headed Canadian doctor, of French descent on one side and English on the other, the very last man to own to nerves or be subject to delusions. He listened to me with a somewhat singular smile. Then he blew a meditative whiff from his pipe and said quietly, You seem cocksure about it. I suppose you never saw a ghost. I'm inclined to think that neither I nor anyone else ever saw one, I answered stoutly. So, let me see. It's November, I think. The 15th of November. How lonesomely the wind howls. I remember just such a night as this, 22 years ago. I'll tell you the story of it. I'm a tolerably sane man. At least, I suppose that's your present opinion, eh? Rather the sanest man I know, I should say. Very well. I'll take that statement at its present value. You'll probably want to change it by the time I get through. After this point, our dialogue ceased, and I listened to Dr. Gerard's story without once interrupting him. I'll drop my quotation marks, therefore, and let him tell the tale just as he told it to me on the 15th of November, A.D., 1888. Twenty-two years and two weeks ago, I came home from my mother's funeral with a desperately sad heart. My father was an Englishman, as you know. He died when I was but a boy, yet I remember his resolute, though kindly nature, his strength of will, his conservatism, all about him, in short, as well as if he had died but yesterday. I had an unbounded reverence for him, which, indeed, he well deserved, but my whole boyish heart was given to my mother. She was French, and she had all a Frenchwoman's charm. She was a stately height and splendid figure, and she had great dark eyes in which I could always read her thoughts. How tender those eyes could be, and also how proud and cold. She was notably beautiful in her young days, as I have often been told since by those who remembered her. I never thought whether she was beautiful or not. I only knew she was my mother, and that I adored her. I can remember well the passionate grief with which she mourned my father. I truly believe that she only went on living for my sake. For my sake, too, after the first few months, she did her best to hide her grief, and to share my life, and to make herself my cheerful companion as before. She had one little trick that I always associate with her memory. I was a great sleeper. She, on the contrary, was naturally an early riser, and she believed in the morning hours as the best time for all mental work. If I slept beyond seven o'clock, she always used to wake me by scratching with her delicate nails upon my pillow. I used instantly to open my eyes at this sound, and sometimes was rewarded with roses, sometimes with motherly kisses, I was so unlike most boys as really to value. Forgive me. I am dwelling too long on the past, and it is not the story of those early days that I want to tell you. They went by quickly enough. I entered college, got through creditably, took my degree, studied medicine, and at twenty-four began my practice in my native town, where my father had been for many years a successful physician. People seemed to believe in me from the first, for his sake, for I had none of the hard struggle that usually attends the beginning of a profession. I had a paying practice, even the first year, and by the time I was twenty-six I felt myself really established. My mother was unreasonably proud of me. That's a kind of delusion to which mothers are subject. Not one single shadow had ever come between us, and I did not suppose that one ever could. I was sent for one day to attend a new case in a part of the town a little out of my usual beat, I found my patient the most beautiful girl I had ever seen, even though then, when I was twenty-six, and my mother was forty-four, she might have safely challenged the comparison with this lovely young creature of eighteen. My mother was dark and stately and proud, a woman to be worshipped. Lena Gray was slight, blue-eyed, sensitive, with a gentle, appealing manner, 
and a shy color that came and went on her cheeks at every breath. Her illness was not very serious, merely a sort of slow fever, but her parents were unduly alarmed about her. They were such people as I had been accustomed to consider quite out of my sphere, having been brought up by my mother, who had a right to D before her name, and all the absurd prejudices against trade which belonged to her race. I should never have expected to find anyone with the breeding of a lady under John Gray's roof, but my mother was no more exquisitely refined than this girl, who soon began to seem to me the one desirable object in the whole world. I shrank weakly from speaking about her to my mother, for I foresaw a struggle. I never dreamed, however, but that in this struggle I should speedily triumph. I made sure that my mother loved me too well to hold out long against my wishes, but I thought I would wait before speaking to her until I was sure of Lena's heart. That time was not long in coming. Some magnetic attraction drew us together from the very first, and when I asked her one day if she loved me, she raised her appealing eyes to my face almost reproachfully and said, Don't you know I do, Arthur? I asked her of her parents, and they promised her to me gladly, and in that moment something like a first presentment of trouble crossed my mind. What if my mother should not consent? You must understand, I said, that I have not spoken on this matter to my mother. I hope she will approve, but whether she does or not, remember you have promised to give me Lena. I am twenty-six years old. Besides my practice, I have a comfortable fortune, inherited from my father, and I am quite able to please myself. They made some weak remonstrances against thrusting their daughter upon a family where she was not wanted, but I overruled them. Lena is mine, I said resolutely as I went away, and my heart grew strong, feeling that I had her happiness to care for as well as my own. I went to my mother and told her my love story. She listened in ominous silence. When I ceased speaking, she said, I understand that you ask my permission to present to me as your betrothed, and afterward to make your wife, the daughter of John Gray, a tradesman? Yes, I answered in tones as resolute as her own. I asked just that. And then, my voice softening in spite of myself, I cried, Only see her once, and you will understand. You will know that she is truly a lady as any Gerard or Debris of all my ancestors, and you love me, your own boy, too well to wish to break my heart. She rose and stood there in the clear light, so tall, so proud, so beautiful, that it seemed as if nothing on earth could resist her. Her voice when she spoke was resolute and strong. There was not one trace in tone or manner of indecision, not one ray of hope for me. It is because you are my own boy, and because with all my heart and soul I love you, that I say no, 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 ten thousand times no. If you choose to lift this girl out of the mud and make her your wife, you are legally free to do so. Your fortune is your own. You can rush headlong on your fate if you please. But if you marry this low-born girl, so long as God spares my life on earth, I will never willingly look upon her face. If you care to see me, you must come without her, and you will spare me all mention of her name. Goodbye, mother, I said, and I went away, leaving her standing there in the sunlight, with her great eyes flashing and her cheeks and lips glowing. Well, I married Lena. She understood perfectly the condition of things, but she was too childlike and trusting to be made unhappy by it. She believed me entirely when I told her that she could suffice for me, that having her, I should want nothing else. I even believed myself for a time. But after the first surprise of marriage was over, and when I had brought my wife back from her marriage journey, and settled down at home in the house I had taken, I began to feel an intolerable yearning for the mother whose love, until I knew Lena, had been the one great joy and rest of my life. Would I have been unmarried again if I could? No, I think not. I loved Lena. She was as near to me as my own soul. If only we two, made one, could have had my mother's blessing. I wrote letters in which I prayed for this. They were never answered. I went one day to the house, my mother's house, and sent up my card like a stranger. The old man-servant brought me back a penciled message. I will receive my son with pleasure, on the understanding that the person to whom he formerly spoke to me is not to be mentioned. To see her on those conditions, 
seemed a sort of treachery to Lena, and I went sadly home again. Sometimes in my professional drives, I met my mother driving her fast-trotting ponies in her little carriage where I had so often sat beside her, and we exchanged civil bows, she and I, who was flesh of her flesh and bone of her bone. When Lena and I had been married a year, our little girl was born, and from the first it seemed as if she should have been my mother's child, not ours. She resembled neither of us, for I was like my father, a fair-haired Saxon, and this child, born of our love and our sorrow, was the very image of my mother in miniature. There was something almost uncanny in her great dark eyes, so much too large for her baby face. Her little fringe of hair was jet black, and her cheeks and lips were as bright as my mother's own. We named the little one Virginie, my mother's name, and as time went on, it grew to seem to me a certainty that her grandmother, however she might scorn my wife, could not withhold her heart from this child, who was so utterly hers by all the signs of nature. She was a wonderfully strong and forward little creature. When she was ten months old she could say various words, and every day I showed her a large picture of my mother and taught her to say Grandma when she saw it. By the time she was fourteen months she could walk, holding by my hand, and one day I took her to see my mother, leaving my wife at home. It was a brilliant May day. The roses were beginning to bloom in sheltered nooks where the sun shone warmly, and the fruit trees were in flower. Some birds chattered as we crossed the lawn on our way to the well-known, dear old house, and Virginie pulled my hand to make me stop and look at them, and just then my mother came round a clump of trees and stood suddenly confronting us. Virginie glanced at her, and saw the face of the picture, and put out her little hands. Grandma, she cried, Grandma. Oddly enough, this word, which in some blind way I had relied upon to move my mother's heart, seemed to repel and offend her. She evidently considered the whole scene as a carefully planned coup de theater, and scorned it accordingly. Her face was cold, her eyes were hard, her voice cut the air like steel. You make a mistake, she said in bringing here that person's child. I do not care to see her. And with those words she turned her back on us and walked off deliberately. Virginie, unused to repulse, put up her piteous, quivering lips for my healing kiss, and I hurried her away. That ended all hope and effort on my part to be reconciled to my mother. Ought to I have striven further? Sometimes I think so now, but I did not think so then. I used to see her at a distance from time to time as the summer went on, and she seemed to me to be changing strangely. Her bright color was gone, her face was growing thin. Some indefinable shadow of growing old age appeared to be settling down upon her. On the morning of the 30th of October I heard a strenuous summons at my office door and opened it. My mother, I was told, had been found dead in her bed. They had sent for the nearest doctor and he had pronounced it heart disease. Yes, I said to myself, it was a disease of the heart in more ways than one. I hurried to the old home. I walked up the path on which she had met the child and me, and looked at us with scorn and repulsion. Had she ever been sorry since, I wondered? Was she wrong in not forgiving me? Or was I wholly to blame, because I had disobeyed her in the first place? I kept asking myself these questions in a dazed way, but I did not try to answer them. My brain seemed reeling. I felt like one clutching at some crazy plank amid the surge and toss of overwhelming seas. I stood by the bed on which they had laid her. Was there something unutterably strange and sad on her face? At war with the accustomed peace of death? I thought so. I knelt beside her. I do not know whether my lips uttered any cry, but I knew that with all the passion of my soul... I prayed her to forgive me if the wrong had been mine, to grant me some token that she loved me still. But the cold, beautiful face did not soften. The relentless lips held their secret. The second day of November I followed her to the grave. I did not take my wife with me. She who had been undesired and unwelcomed in my mother's life had no place at her tomb. I think, had I taken her there... I should have expected the scornful lips to break their frozen death silence and denounce me. I was half mad with grief and remorse, and I abandoned myself to fears and instincts 
but had no power to reason. Two weeks went on. I found myself unable to fulfill my usual duties. Few of my patients were seriously ill, and I made my recent bereavement an excuse for confiding them to the care of another physician. You see, I do not conceal from you the disordered state of my own mind, but I have other testimony than my own of the truth and reality of the story to which all that I have already told you is but the preface. On the night of the 15th of November I went to bed earlier than usual, utterly exhausted by my vigil since my mother's death, and I presently fell into a deep sleep. But before I dozed off, I remember listening to the wild wails of the wind. As I said, it was night like tonight. The unquiet wind assailed the windows, and now and then uttered a low, keen cry. It made me think of a spirit in pain, and I shuddered at it. The sleep that presently overcame me was merciful. It must have been some time past midnight when I awoke suddenly, so wide awake, that I found myself sitting up in bed and listening intently to an approaching sound. It was the rumbling of my mother's carriage that I heard. I never could have mistaken those wheels for any other, and the quick trot of her high-stepping ponies along the hard road. The carriage stopped at my gate. I did not awaken my wife, who was sleeping beside me, but I remember thinking with a sort of dull satisfaction how securely I had barred the front door. But in spite of bars, it seemed to me that I heard it open, and I know that I heard my mother's footsteps come up the stairs and along the hall and enter my very chamber. I sank back against the pillow and shut my eyes and feigned to be asleep, and presently, doubt it as you will, I heard upon my pillow the same scratching of her slender fingers with which she used to wake me when I was a boy. I opened my eyes and saw, for a night lamp was burning as usual, the unutterable sadness of her look. Then she moved away and walked to the crib, where at a little distance my child was sleeping, and I give you my word that as she stood there, as if under some strange compulsion, Virginie opened her eyes, fixed them for a moment or two on my mother's face, said, Grandma, and then threw up her little hands over her head and seemed to go to sleep again. My mother stood there looking at her for some moments. Then she slowly moved away and passed out of the room, and I remember that at that very moment the clock struck one. In a moment more I heard the rumble of her carriage and the trotting feet of her ponies, and then I put on my dressing gown and lit a candle at the night lamp and went downstairs. The door was bolted and barred just as I had left it, and there was no trace anywhere of the mysterious presence that had passed. I lay awake and pondered over what had happened. Surely she had heard my prayers for her forgiveness, and she had come to show me that she had accorded it to me, and I thought she had stood so long beside the child to show me that her old stern resolution not to see her was over now. I tried to feel satisfied and relieved, but I was haunted by the sadness of her look. There must be something she wanted to convey besides her forgiveness. What could it be? Do you wonder that I remember well the 15th of November, the first time I ever knew, believed, or even dreamed that the dead could come again? Before that I was as scornfully skeptical as you are now. As I lay there and thought, the teasing wind blew a branch of the leafless tree against the pane with a sort of scratching sound not unlike the one with which my mother had awakened me. It made me shiver. I drew the bedclothes over my head, and finally I went to sleep. In the morning I kept silence about what had passed, and the next night I bolted and barred the doors as usual. I did not certainly anticipate another visit from my mother, for I thought she had come to make known her forgiveness, and that being done, would stay quietly in the grave where we had laid her. Still the hour between midnight and one o'clock found me very wide awake indeed. I was certainly in no less clear possession of my faculties than I am at this moment, when I heard again the rumble of that carriage, the feet of those ponies. This time my mother had no need to awaken me. My eyes met hers as she entered the room. I had left the night lamp a little higher than before. I saw that she was dressed as she was when we laid her in her coffin, in a rich, soft falling gown of heavy black satin. I could see on her finger her wedding ring, the only one we had buried with her. This time she did not come to my bedside, but she went and bent over the child's. And again, as if by some strange compulsion, the little one opened her eyes and murmured rather sleepily, Grandma, come again. And in a moment, 
was once more asleep. But no smile came to the sad eyes that were watching her. The shadow of an immortal pain seemed on the face which death had given back. I longed to speak to her, but I could not. My throat was parched. My tongue would not move. I hardly breathed. Suddenly the clock struck one, and on the stroke of it, she vanished. The next morning I told my wife. She was strongly impressed by my story, which she never thought of arguing away or even of questioning. She begged me if our visitor ever came again to awaken her, which finally, with some reluctance, I promised to do. The third night arrived, and I was mercifully able to go to sleep. I did not hear the rumble of the carriage at the gate or the feet of the ponies. I heard nothing, indeed, until the sound of the delicate fingers I knew so well, scratching on my pillow as of old, awakened me. I opened my eyes, and the sad eyes of the dead met them, and then, as before, my mother moved away and stood over the bed of my little Virginie. Lena, I whispered to my wife. She slipped her hand into mine. I hear, she answered in a low whisper. I am watching her. I think she wants something. Low as her whisper was, evidently my mother heard it, and a look of unmistakable relief and hope crossed her face. My mother was observing her closely, and her woman's instinct supplied the interpretation of this look my duller wits never could have done. I think, Lena said slowly, that she wants us to forgive her. These words seemed to me a sort of sacrilege. I would have thrown myself at my mother's feet and prayed anew for her forgiveness. But some power outside myself restrained me, and surely a look of relief, as of one who is understood at last after a long endeavor, dawned upon her face and yet she seemed not quite satisfied. Then Lena spoke, and her voice sounded to me like that of an angel whom love had made strong, and she said with gentle clearness of tone, Yes, mother, we forgive you with all our hearts. As if constrained, and almost against my will, I too said after her, as one says amen, after a prayer, with all our hearts. And just that moment Virginie opened her eyes and cried, Grandma, come again. And though my eyes were dim with a rush of sudden tears, it seemed to me that I saw my mother bend toward her and the child's arms reach up for an instant to her neck. And then my mother lifted her face, her happy face, and there was a light in her great eyes such as made me think of the days of her youth when she used to welcome my father home. Her lips moved. I thought they formed the words, Goodbye, children, and at that moment the clock struck one, and she was gone. Then I heard for the last time the rumble of her departing wheels, and Lena heard it also, and cried softly and silently as she lay there with her head on my bosom. One day, a week afterward, Virginie said, Grandma never comes any more, and we knew that the child remembered. No, I never saw any other ghost. Why should I? I do not think they are visitors of every day, but I know, whether it be possible for the dead to return or not, that twenty-two years ago this night I saw my mother, who had been two weeks buried, standing at my bedside. The End